the blindness of your heart, part six. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Now, you remember what we talked about last week. The face is the outside part. The deep is the heart. And human beings, right, have what inside of them? Darkness, right? Mm -hmm. And it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. And so I think the society that we live in, and we'll, we'll talk about this just a little bit, is everybody wants to find fault in the Word of God. They want to say there's lies in it, that it's not correct, right? And what they do, what they do is they base that upon what's in their heart. They feel like the Bible can't be true. They feel like it's not true, right? When the reality is the problem is not the Word. The Word is truth. The Word is life, right? What, look what, God, look what the, uh, John says. This then is the message which we have heard of him and, and declare unto you that God is light and in him... In God is, guess what? No darkness. There, there's no darkness. It's all light. So in the scripture, it's it's all light. So the problem isn't with the word. The, the I'll show you what the problem is here in just a second. He says, the entrance of thy words giveth what? So inside of you is darkness, right? Yes. Not inside of God. There is no darkness. And so when you read the word where there is nothing but light, the entrance of those words, which are nothing but light, enter in. And guess what those words do? Give they give up light. They give up understanding. So if there's darkness inside of you, it's not because of the word. It's not because of God's truth. He says, look what he says here. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now, revelation is the act of disclosing or discovering what was before unknown to them. So God wants you to understand the revelation. Or he wants to reveal unto you the knowledge of, guess who? Of, of himself, what he's like, what he expects, right? Because he doesn't change. He, if you do good, he rewards you. You do bad, he punishes you. He wants you to understand him. So guess what he wants to do? He wants to give you understanding. He wants to give you wisdom and revelation. He wants to look, look at look look at revelation again. Communication of truth to men by God himself, that which is revealed. He wants to reveal things to you, right? And guess how he does it? The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth what? Yeah. Understanding. And it giveth <laughs> light. And guess what? There is no darkness. It's all light. Now, well, the way it says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So look what he calls your understanding. Because, right, what does the light do? It giveth what? It giveth understanding. And he says, when that light enters in, he gives you revelation of the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being what? So the, the interest of thy words enlightens your understanding that you may what? Think, feel, no. know. See that word no? Look, look at the word right above no right here. Let me show you. See that word no? Guess what? Guess where that word comes from? Knowledge. Knowledge. The entrance of the words give of wisdom, understanding, revelation of who God really is, and there's no darkness in Him, right? right. So if you don't understand what God is like, if you read the Word and you don't understand what God is like, is it because there's is it because there's defects in his word or in him? No. no, here it is. Because for you to get light inside of you, guess where it has to go? Through your what? Eyes. 
-hmm. It goes through your, your eyes and your ears, right? right? And so the problem isn't with the book. The problem isn't with God. The reason there's darkness in you as a believer or that you believe lies or you or God has not completely totally revealed himself to you isn't his fault. The problem is with your eyes and your ears. Right. Look what he says here. He says, the light of the body is the what? Ah, that's how when you read the word, right? Because the entrance of the words give a flight. The problem it is something's going to have to be a problem with the, uh, with the eyes because guess what? The light of the body is the eye. The way that light gets into that darkness inside of you is through what? The eye. The eye. So if your eye is single, now look at the word single, pure and incorrupt, having clear vision. So they're of divine truth, not double. And I'll tell you what that means in a second. So God's saying, really, the only thing that is hindering you from being full of light is yourself. It's your eyes and your ears, right? That's where the problem is. He says, if your eye is single, if your eye has clear vision, if your eye is incorrupt, if your eye is pure, thy whole body shall be what? Full of light. Even though it's darkness now, the entrance of the words give it light. So as long as your eyes are, there's nothing stopping you from having, guess what, clear vision, you should be full of what? You should be full of light. He says right here, but if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So the the problem, the, the most of Christianity and most of the world, and you hear Christians arguing about all the time about Bible versions and you know, we don't have a perfect Bible and there might be mistakes in it. That That's the devil. The devil does that because doubt. He wants to cause doubt. Mm -hmm. He says, if any of you, if any of you as a believer lack wisdom, guess all you have to do? Ask for it. You ask for God. That does what? Give it. Give up. Isn't, it, isn't that what it said up here? that the Father of glory may give unto you what? The spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So if you ask, God says, I will give it to you to all men liberally and upright if not, and it shall be given him. But there's a condition. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as he that, I mean, I'm sorry, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He says, let not that man, he asks, but there's something, there's a problem, he's, he's wavering. He says, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Now look what he says. What kind of mind? Double. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Well, remember right here, he says, if your eye is single, you'll be full of light. And one of the definitions of single was not double. You're supposed to be single-minded. If you're single-minded, God says that when you read the word, that light will come in and guess what? It will make your whole body full of light. Right. But if you have a double mind, you're not single. But Okay, so the definition of single is what? Pure. So what would be double-minded? Impure. The definition of single is incorrupt. So what would be the definition of double-minded? Corrupt. Single is clear-minded. So double-minded is not clear vision, right? right? And the problem is not with the word because God is, there's no darkness in him. It's, that book is full of light. So what's the problem? The problem is that you're double-minded and that there's something blocking your vision. You don't have clear vision. Therefore, the light cannot do what? Enter in. Look what he says here about the word. Being born again, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but what kind of seed? Incorrupt. What's one of the definitions of single and corrupt, right? Yes. He says in Psalm 119, 140, thy word is what? Very pure. What's the first definition of single? It's pure. 
So the word is incorruptible. The word is pure. And by definition, that means it's single. It's you you have clear if you have clear vision and there is nothing covering your eye or stopping you from seeing it clearly, you're going to be full of light. A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. He that saith he is in the light and does what? Is in darkness. <coughs> why, <clears throat> why is that? Because there's obviously something making his vision not what? Cle it's not clear, right? right. Because if, if you've got single vision, if if you're pure, if you're incorrupt, there you shouldn't be walking in darkness. But there's going to be something in your eye stopping that light from entering in. You think it's entering in. You think you're walking in light. But if you hate your brother, guess what God's saying? Your vision's not clear. You're double-minded. He says, he that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, and he knoweth not whither he go, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. So there are things that will, that word is nothing but light. And it will fill you, and if your eye is single, it will make you full of light. You'll never have to worry about stumbling. You'll have, you'll have understanding in the truth. But there are things that are going to block the eye because the eye is what? what remember what it says up here? Let's go back up here and look. The light of the body is the what? Is the eye. That's how light enters into the body, which is in, dark, is in darkness, and it gives you light. Right. And anything that impedes the eyes or the ears from hearing is going to stop that light from what? Entering in. Mm -hmm. So we understand something. The eyes of your understanding is your mind. Right. Okay? Now, now watch this. He says, and afterward, all the children of Israel came nigh. And we talked about this story last week. And he gave them commandment, all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. So there's truth. God had given Moses truth. He's going to try to give it to the other people, right? right? And he says, until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. They couldn't handle that light. Well, the entrance of the light gives what? It's understanding. It's knowledge of him, right? Mm -hmm. They can't handle that light. So when he would speak, he'd have a veil and when you got a veil on your face, guess what? That light cannot enter in. Right. It's impeding the eye, which is the, the light of the body. So when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, and you remember this last week, but this is what we talked about, that when the father looks into the mirror, he sees the image of himself, yes. which is the son. And when you look into, <clears throat> in the, who is the son? He's the word. So when you look into the mirror, which is the word of God, you're going to see Christ. And not only are you going to see Christ, when you stay in the presence of him, right? As long as you take the veil off, whatever glory that God has, guess what it's going to do? It's going to get, you're going to have that glory also. So when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, guess what you have to do? You have to take the veil off. Anything that is impeding, because the, the eye is the light of the body, right? You got to take the veil off or else the light cannot, the understanding cannot what? Enter into the body and give you light. So he came out and he spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses because Moses had been in the presence of God without a veil. And they saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. It was shining. And Moses put the veil upon his face when he was talking to these people again until he went in to speak with him, talking about God. And so when you speak with God, when you want to find out what God is, you want to have revelation of God, right? You go to the Word. Right. 
Right. You're, that is, when you look into the scripture, you're looking into the face of God, and in the scripture are the deep things of God, right? You're communicating with him. He is showing you through his spirit deep things. But if you have a veil on your eyes, something, if you hate your brother, or guess what's going to, guess what the problem is? You got something in your eye and it's going to stop the light from doing what? Mm -hmm. you, you might think you're walking in light, but you're really in what? Mm -hmm. You're in darkness if you hate your brother. He says, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, seeing then that we have such hope, and, and this is the reason that I teach the way that I teach. Some people think, well, you, you know, you, you, you sound like you're talking to children. Well, the, the Pharisees, guess what they try to do? Guess what all the Pharisees of the world do? All the pastors of the world do? They've been to seminary. They've got this great education, right? They want to make, well, in the Greek, it means this. And in the Hebrew, it means this. And they go to all these different, they go to all these different means to make the word sound more complicated than it really is. Because God says what he means and he means what means what he says. And if you'll just read what's on the page, guess what? God will tell you very clearly what he expects, what he's like. Paul even says, since we have such hope, we use great plainness. Plain, you know what plain means? Just plain. We use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Now look what he says. But their minds were what? Blinded. Why, why are they blinded? Why can they not see? Why is their heart dark? Because of the veil. He says, for unto this day, remaineth, guess what? The same veil untaken away. But not just untaken away, untaken away in the reading of the what? The, the, the Old Testament. They don't, they couldn't see Christ in the Old Testament. They were blind to it. So when he came, did they recognize him? No. They didn't. They, he came into his own, his own crucified him. He says that same veil is there when they read the Old Testament, which veil is done away with in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. The veil is upon their heart. They can't see the truth. Matter of fact, you remember on the road to Emmaus, he saw these two men, right? And, and he, he comes up, they don't recognize him. And what, what's he saying to them? He said, what are y'all talking about? He said, are you are you new to Jerusalem? Are you a stranger? You're not heard? They say that Christ is risen. And then he opened their eyes, right? And he began to go from Moses and the prophets and the Psalms showing them himself in the Old Testament because they couldn't see it. So what is it what is it that makes a man double-minded where he has that beam in his eye, he has that veil on his eyes where he can't see the whole truth? The light will not enter in. He will not be full of light. Well, he's double-minded for a reason. He says no servant can serve what? Two masters. Two masters. For either he will hate the one and he'll love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise it. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the devil. You can't serve God and money. You, you, you can't serve God in the world. We all know that you can't love them both at the same time. When a couple gets married, they get married because they love one another, right? Their affection is toward each other. But then one of them goes and he goes out into the world and he starts working and he either starts flirting with the girl or the girl starts flirting with him. And all of a sudden his heart, his affection changes toward this other person, this other woman, or this, if it's the woman, the other man, right? And they begin. And then all of a sudden they can't go home and give that wife the same affection and attention because too much of their affection and attention is going to this woman over here. 
And God's saying that, guess what? I want all of your affection. I want all of your attention. And when you and when you give attention to the world or mammon, you got a beam in your eye. You got a veil on your face. And guess what? So when you read that light, the inter- guess what? The light can't enter in. So all of a sudden now you're becoming dark inside. You can, just because you're reading it doesn't mean anything. If, if you don't take the veil off, the light will have no effect on you. <clears throat> and he's saying, if you, if you and your attention is given to any other place outside of God, you're going to be dark inside. You got to take the veil. Look what he says here. He's talking to Christians. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, right? You're supposed to be married to me. Know you not that friendship of the other woman or the other man, the world, right? That's enmity with God. He hates that. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world, the other man, the other woman, is the enemy of their spouse now because all their attention is being focused on somebody else. God doesn't want you to give any attention to the world, to money, to any of those things. Look what he says. He says, love not the world, neither the things, not just the world, the things, the stuff that's in the world. Money, possessions, having food and raiment, be what? Content. He says, if any man love the world, right, or he's a friend, look what it says here. Whoops. I don't know why I have a hard time finding my cursor. Oh, there it is. Okay. So if uh, any man love the world or has friendship with the world or is a friend of the world, right? It says, not only is he an enemy of God, he says the love of the father is what? Mm -hmm. Of course, the love of the father is not in him. Your attention is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. If you want to have the love of the father in you, right? The true love of the father you can't serve two masters. Right. You got to take the veil off. If you want truth, if you want the truth and you want God to show you truth and have your body full of light, you got to take the veil off. You got to get the beam out of your eye. But what he says, he says, we now see through a glass what? It's not the word is not the problem. The problem is your eyes and your ears. And that you're double-minded. And he wants you to be single-minded. He wants you to be pure. He wants you to be incorrupt. And you got your heart somewhere else. He says, why beholdest the moat that in the, is in thy brother's eye? Right? You, you, it's so easy to see somebody else. Oh, I know why. I know why they, they're, I know why they believe that lie. I know why they're walking in darkness. Look at that thing in their eye. But you don't consider what? The beam in your eye, the veil that's over your eyes. How wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull the moat out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in you. How can you see to pull something out of his eye when you got something in your eye? You're blind. That's why he says, thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt, what's the words? Thou shalt see clearly. So let's go back here. Remember, thou shalt see clearly. Oops. Um, well, where is it at? Oh, there it is. Single. Right there. Having clear vision. Pull out the moat. And thou shalt see clearly to pull out the mote out of thy brother's hand. What's he saying? He's saying that you are double-minded. You you got one foot in the world and you got one foot in heaven, or at least you think you do. But the reality is you don't have any light. Look what he says. If thy whole body shall be full of darkness, right? He says, how great is that darkness? 
because you're hating your brother because you want to you want stuff. You want the you want to have you want to be in the world. You want to have money. You want to have steam. You want people to think all these great things about you. You know what it said about Christ? He esteemed others better than himself. Right. You can't serve two masters, or you're going to have a beam in your eye. If you got a beam in your eye, you can read that Bible every day. You can read it 24 hours a day. But if you got a veil. That light that is in that word is not going to go in through your eyes and it's not going to go in your heart and it's not going to light the inside of you up. Right. You got to take the moat. You got to take the beam. You got to take the veil off. He says uh, in Acts, he says, and when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah. Isaiah. So Isaiah says something. He says, um, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing you shall hear. In other words, you can physically hear something going into your ear, but guess what? You shall not understand. And seeing you shall see. You can read the books, the words on the page, right? right. And not perceive it. You know why? For the heart of this people is wax gross. Now, let me show you these two words, okay, so you understand. The word wax means to pass from one state to another as to wax worse, right? right. The word gross means impure, stupid, or dull. So, so stupid, We, because we hear people call people stupid all the time, right? right. It actually has a definition. It means very dull, senseless, wanting and understanding. In other words, you don't have under if you don't have understanding, that is what stupid is. And so the thing about it is look, look at those, look at that, what gross is. They have waxed gross. They have they have changed from one state to another state. They have went from pure to impure. Well. When we go back up here, remember what it means to be single? Go back. Pure. Yeah, it means to be pure. Oops. To be pure or incorrupt and having clear vision. But these, guess what? They have went from what? They have, they have right here. Hearing they sh shall not understand, seeing they shall not perceive, for their heart is waxed, changed, Becoming into a worse state of what? Being impure. They're becoming stupid. Why? Because if the words can't get in there, it's darkness. You're walking in darkness. He goes on, he says, um, for the heart of the people's wax grows and they're Ears are dull of hearing. And you can look in those in both of those definitions right there, gross and in stupid, you see the word dull. Now we when we think of the word dull, we think of a knife, right? It gets what? Dull. It gets dull. And if a dull knife, dull knives are useless. Right. You need sharp knives, right? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about that in a second. So you have become dull of hearing. Do you and let me show you why here in just a second. Look what he says. You have become dull of hearing and their eyes have been closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be what? Converted. The word converts mean if you will listen, if you will hear and you will understand, God can change or turn you into another substance or form. Is that not what he's trying to do? He's trying to make you an earthly creature of a divine nature like him. He wants to convert you, wants to change you from one state to another, to turn from a bad life to a good one, to change the heart. That's what convert means. And he's telling you that there's only one way to do it. You've got to get rid of this not listening, not hearing. And how do you do that? Take the veil off. You got to pull the beam out of your eye. Okay? Yes. 
Timothy, he says, evil men and seducers, here's that word again, shall what? Wax worse, whoops, worse and worse. Look at that word wax again. To pass from a, one state to another. He's saying that they're going to, believers in the last days are going to get what? Worse and worse. Why? Why are they getting worse and worse? They're deceiving and they're being what? Deceived. You know why? They got beams in their eyes. They're hating their brother. They love the world more than they love God. But he says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou has, what he says, known what? The holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Well, how do they make you wise? How do they fill you with light? Because that's what being wise is, is the entrance of thy words give us understanding, right? Give us light. Well, here's, here's what it means. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for what? Correction. Correction. You don't, listen, if you're right about everything, you don't need the scriptures. If you have every doctrine right and you're correct about every single thing, and that's the problem with most people, is when someone talks to them or tries to tell them something, guess what they do? They shut their ears, they close their eyes. And when you close your eyes and shut your ears, you can't, light cannot what? Enter in. Enter in. He wants you to open your eyes, take out the beam, right? Take off the veil, because that's, if you read the scripture and you take off the veil, now the light, the understanding comes in and it'll show you that you're wrong about some things. And if you're wrong and then he corrects you and now you're right, then all of a sudden, that impure mind is becoming purified. There's a change taking a place. There's a conversion of being changed from one substance to another. A change of heart. And that's what, that's the entire <laughs> purpose is that the man of God may be what? Perfect. Be ye perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. Be ye holy as I am holy. You can't do that with a veil on your eyes. And that's the problem with most Christians. You've got a million different denominations in the world and you can go visit their church because they think the building is the church. Right. You go visit their church and guess what? They say, well, if you don't agree with our doctrine, you should go find another church, another building. Rather than listening to you and maybe you have some truth or some light that could enter into their eyes if they would take the veil off. But guess what they refuse to do? They refuse to take the veil off. They're never going to allow the word of God to correct them. Therefore, the light can't enter in. And that therefore, guess what? They're full of darkness. Right. And how great is that darkness? Now, when Jesus spoke, you're going to see a difference. You're going to see a difference between the Pharisee and a difference between the common people. Right? The people who are so called educated, the people who've been to seminary that supposedly know the word of God and is trying to teach it to you, they're, they're, God says there is a difference. He says, and Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how say the scribes that Christ is the Son of God? He's asking a question. For David himself said, said by the Holy Ghost, the Lord said to my Lord, sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore himself calleth him Lord. And whence is he then his son? So he's basically asking a question. How is David calling Christ or the Lord, but yet the Lord is his son? But that, that, was, that was above what the Pharisees could understand. But the common people that just took him at what he said, guess what? They hurt him gladly. Isn't that what Paul said in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians? We use great plainness of speech. The, the words on the book 
are not hard to understand unless you got a beam in your eye, unless you have a preconceived idea of what the truth is, unless you hate your brother. Because if you hate your brother, you remember the Pharisees, they, um, Jesus told them, he says, um, these are the two great commandments. He says, matter of fact, if you keep these two commandments, you fulfill the whole law. He says, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and love thy neighbor as thyself. So guess what they try to do? Well, who's my neighbor? So you know what he did? He took the person they hated the most and said, that's your neighbor. You see what he did? There's a beam in their eye. They don't want to be, they don't want the truth. They don't want to be obedient. They want to do what they want to do. God uses in his word great plainness of speech. When I teach, I try to use great plainness of speech. So the common people, listen, the pastors might not hear me. The people in the seminaries who think they're smarter than everybody might not hear me. But they've got beams in their eyes. It's called the, one of the things is called the pride of life. Look, remember right up here, he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, right? Because right. look at the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, right? The lust of the eyes and the what? The pride of life. Those are all beams that are in your eyes that if you don't get rid of them, you're not going to see the truth. It will hinder you from seeing the truth. And that's one of the problems with these people. They go to Bible college, they go to seminary, and guess what they think? They think they know everything. <laughs> and the reality is they believe lies, and then they're getting out in the pulpit, and they're teaching lies. And you know what lies are? Their lies are a corruptible seed of the devil. And they're passing the seed around. They're spreading Satan's seed because... Nobody can question. You should just go to another church if you don't believe our doctrine. So they're up there preaching lies. The people that are listening to them believe everything they say, and therefore those lies are ending into their heart. And now guess what? They've got corrupt hearts. Yes. It's our responsibility, guess what, to do? To spread truth. To expose the lies. Paul, right to the Hebrew, says, of whom we have many things to say. And it's hard to be uttered. You know why? Seeing you are what? Dull. Look at that word dull. There it is again. That's not my words. It's stupid. It's slow of understanding. Slow of hearing or seeing as dull of hearing. Slow to learn or comprehend. Unready to learn, right? insensible, not bright or clear, clouded, like a cloudy day. You can't see the what? The sun, tarnished as the mirror is dull. You're supposed to be looking into the mirror and seeing the image of Christ, and it changes you into to, to him. But guess what? It's dull. It's cloudy. It's overcast. You're dull of hearing. You've clogged up your ears. You've, you've, you've covered your eyes with a veil. And God says, you're not going to be able to see the truth unless you'll do what? Take it all. He says, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word. He's a babe. Strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Now, watch this. We just said, okay, milk are for babies. And these believers are dull of hearing. They've probably been believers 10, 20 years. They're sitting in the church. They got... They believe all these lies. They got bells on their eyes. They got their ears are clogged up. But the ones that can, that, that have strong meat, right, that are of full age, here's why, here's why they can eat strong meat. Here's why they're, they're mature Christians. They're not babies anymore. Look what it says. Even those who by reason of use have their senses, what? 
exercised. They, they are, look, look at this word down here if I can find it, insensible. That's the opposite of having your exercise, your senses exercised. You're insensible. You're not using it. The reason they're skilled in the word is they, by reason of use, they have the word coming in. It's all that light's coming in. And guess what they're doing? They're turning around and that light is shining out toward other people. You know, we talk about hiding the word in your heart, right? Well, you take the veil off, you hide the word in the heart, your heart, the entrance of that words give a flight, right? But the word is also, the word right down here is also called, let me show you, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a what? So the word is a sword. So here's how you stay sharp. Here's how you don't have to be dull of hearing. You stay sharp because iron does what? Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. So if I've got the word hid in my heart and my friend has the word hid in his heart and we're not going to get offended because we don't believe exactly the same thing, right? <coughs> Guess what we're going to do? He's going to say, well, I believe this. And I said, yeah, I know, but what about this verse over here? And what are we doing? We're sharpening. We're coming to the truth. We're not sitting here saying, well, if you don't believe my doctrine, you got to go to another church. Because that, you, that's not sharpening. That's becoming what? No. Your sword is becoming dull. And so the only way to keep your sword sharp is to take another sword and let each other do what? Iron sharpens iron. And how do you do that? Well, right here. Here's the difference between those believers that are full of light and those believers that are full of darkness. He says, wherefore my beloved, so is he, is he talking, look, look at this right here. Does he look like he's talking to unbelievers right there? Nope. My beloved brethren, let every one of you beloved brethren be swift to hear, take, unclog your ears and be slow to what? When you're arguing with, with somebody and you're when you see two people yelling at each other, you know who they hear? They hear their self. Right. All they hear is what's inside of them. That's that sword that's in the other person. They don't hear it. They don't want to hear it. They're angry. They get angry because somebody's trying to correct them. But what's the word of God for? It's for correction. It's to show you that you're in error, right? is to purify your mind, to get the lies out. He says, he that answereth before he what? You're answering, you, you, have, you haven't even heard what the man has to say yet. And guess what you're doing? Yes. It doesn't matter whether it's another man. It doesn't matter whether it's a child. It doesn't matter whether it's the opposite sex. It doesn't matter if the person's a different color than you. If you if you refuse to if you refuse to hear, the Bible says it's a shame. It's a, you you are a folly and you are a shame because that is the very thing God uses to purify you and to change you and to convert you and to make you like Him. I'm gonna give you a couple examples, and. Uh, So God, here's a believer. This is a believer. This is a prophet of God. God came to Balaam at night. So God literally came to him and said unto him, so God is speaking to Balaam, right? Now look, look, this is what God says to Balaam. If the men come to call thee, Balaam, rise up and go with them. Now, the problem is, there is already in Balaam a beam. There's already a veil. So when God speaks this to him, guess what? Whoops. When he speaks, he hears what he wants to hear. 
He says, if the men come. But yet the word which I say unto thee, Balaam, that shall that do. That was God's word to him. <clears throat> if the men come, you can rise. So you know what you should do, Balaam? Go get you a good night's sleep. If 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 they come and wake you up, then you can go with them. But they didn't do that. Balaam rose up in the morning. He saddled his ass and he went with the princes of Moab. Did, did, did he do what God told him to do? Yeah. No. He already, in his heart, he was going to go whether God wanted him to go or not. He, When he read that word, when he heard that word, he heard what he wanted to hear. Because there's a beam in his eye. So Balaam rose up in the morning, sat on his ass, went with the princes of Moab, and God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way <coughs> for an adversary against him. So now, think about it. What did, what did God say? You adulterers and adulteresses know you not that friendship with the world is, in, if you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. So because he doesn't listen to God's word, the angel of the Lord became an adversary against him. He's now the enemy of God because he's doing the opposite of what God had told him to do. So now he's riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him and the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. Whoops. And his sword drawn in his hand. So the angel's ready to kill him. He's an enemy of God because he didn't listen to God. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a, path, in a path of the vineyards, right? So the angel keeps making the way a little bit more narrow, right? He says a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel, because Balaam couldn't see the angel, but the, the, the donkey could, right? Yes. He says, and so when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And guess what Balaam did? He smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. Nowhere to go now. He can't see the Lord. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam and Balaam's anger was kindled and he smote the ass with a staff. Now watch this. I want you to watch this, okay? Because God said, do this, Balaam. And because Balaam had a beam in his eye, because Balaam was being double-minded. Balaam wanted the glory. Balaam wanted the money, right? Mm -hmm. And you can't have two masters, right? Because mm -hmm. you, if you are, if, you, if, if you're trying to love your wife and love your mistress, you can't do it. Your heart can't be in both places. And so what he says he fell down under Balaam, right? And the Lord, the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. Now, raise your hand if you've ever had a dog or a cat or a horse or a donkey or a cow open his mouth and speak to you in English. <laughs> okay? So this is not something that God commonly does, right? So he opens the mouth of the ass and the ass said unto Balaam, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Now, I don't know about you, but if a donkey opens his mouth and starts speaking to me in English, I'm falling on my face. I'm going to be afraid because I know that's from God. But that's not what Balaam does. You know what Balaam does? He said, look what he says. He says, um, and Balaam said unto the ass, he starts talking to the donkey. 
Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, and now would I cast the, or kill thee. And the ass, well, if he's going to talk to him, I'm going to talk to him again. The ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden <coughs> ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever want to do so unto thee? Have I not been a faithful donkey to you? And Balaam starts to reason. Well, no, you've never done anything like this. Then the Lord, what it says, opened the eyes. He took the veil off and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way and his sword drawn in his hand. And then he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. He, he, I'm telling you right now, you, he should have done that when the donkey opened his mouth. But he's arguing with the donkey. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee. You know why? Here's why I went out to withstand you, and you were my enemy. Because, Balaam, thy way is perverse before me. Now look at that word perverse comes from the word pervert, literally turned aside, distorted from that, from that, that is which is right. He's obstinate in the wrong. He's going to do wrong. He's so obstinate and hard-headed. He is disposed to be contrary. He wants, he's going to do the opposite. He's stubborn. God says, do this. If the men come, guess what? You can go with them. But he'd already made up his mind. Because he's perverse. Look at the word pervert. He's a pervert. He's to, now we take that as being just a man who is, has lust after little children in our society, but that's not what the definition of a pervert is. A pervert is to turn from truth, right? To distort from its true use or end, to turn from the right, to corrupt which is the opposite of being single-minded. He's double-minded. He's a pervert. He's perverse. He was going to do. He's hard-headed. God said, don't get up and go with them unless, I t unless they come and get you. But he'd already made up his mind to the point that a donkey is talking to him and he's still not falling on his face. You know what? Look what it says here. This is talking about believers that have forsaken the right way. They've gone astray, following the way of who? Balaam. There are many believers that do this. They go after the way of Balaam. They love the wages of unrighteousness. But was what it says about Balaam, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the pro He was mad. Who sits around and argues with an animal that's talking to him? Balaam. Balaam. When you, when you want to, when you are so disposed to do opposite of what God tells you to do, when when you're disposed to be contrary or stubborn or obstinate, and you want to turn from the truth, you want to be a pervert, right? You want to turn from what's right? It you're not going to see what God's word really says. And God's word really said, if they come and get you. You know how many times in the Bible it says if and maybe, and believers just read right over it? That, that's the problem. If you would just read what's on the page without a beam in your eye, you'll see the truth. You know, we all must stand before the judgment seat to receive the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Who are you talking to Christians? You're going to receive if you do bad. Knowing the terror of the Lord, we're, we're trying to persuade you. But guess what? You got a beam in your eye. Oh, I don't believe that. I might lose some rewards. Well, I promise you, <laughs> one day when you stand before the Lord, you're going to realize something that your Lust of your eyes and the lust of your flesh and the lust that you have for this world and the hate you had for your brother blinded you from seeing the truth. 
And if you would take, all you had to do is take that veil off and all that darkness inside of you, that light that comes from that word, the entrance of that word, you have a light, that light which should be shining inside of you right now. And guess what? It will shine out of you. Just like Moses took the veil off, right? When he took that veil off and he went down in front of those people, his face was shining. Because he read the word, he listened to the word, he was he talked to the word face to face without a veil, and therefore he was becoming like the very thing that he was looking into. P, um, Peter, he's writing about Paul's writings, and look what he says. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them, speaking in them of these things, in which some of the things that Paul says, they are hard to be understood, right? Which they that are unlearned, they don't study the scripture. They and they're unstable. Why are they unstable? Because a double-minded man is unstable in all his what? Ways. You can't serve two masters and not have your eyes being blinded. He says, you are, un the one, these men that are unlearned and unstable, guess what they do to the scripture? They rest the scripture. What does that word rest mean? Look, to twist, to distort, to turn from truth or twist from its natural meaning by violence. To do what? To pervert it. The natural meaning was... If men come and get you, go with them. That's the natural meaning. But guess what he did? He perverted it. He twisted it. He turned from the truth, and he just got up and went. Well, God just told me to go. No, he didn't. He said, if they come, you can go. So you can't see the scripture clearly with clear vision, right? Because you're double-minded. You love the world more than you love God. You love the, you can't love your wife because you love the other woman more than you love your wife. God says you need to make up your mind. Sit down, count the cost. Do you want the world? The world is there for you. The devil offered Christ the world. He says, I'll give you all, if you'll bow down, I'll give you all the kingdom. It's, it's, the devil says, God, the father gave me <clears throat> I'm the God of this, world, of this world. He gave me these kingdoms. I can give them to whoever I want to. All you got to do is bow down and worship me. If you want the world, go for it. But it's going to come at a cost. If you want the truth, it costs you something. You got to quit flirting with the world. These men, they twist the scripture they pervert, rest the scripture, right? Because they're unlearned and they're unstable. You think, well, they've been to seminary. They, what do you think they teach you in seminaries? Lies. They twist the scripture as they do also the other scriptures. They twist them to fit, fit, to, to fit their lust and their desires so that you will say, oh, you're so smart, and you'll pull out your wallet, and you'll give them money, right? God strike me dead the day that I do that because I would deserve it. I don't. God's not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor of love, which you show toward his name. And if you'll do what is right for the right motive, and you'll keep the beam there, you'll love your brother. You don't hate your brother. Right. If you'll if you'll not love the world and love him unconditionally, you'll be full of light. No darkness. And there's a reason he's trying to make you like that. Right. Look at this story here. Stephen was trying to tell these men truth. And look, look at this. And when they heard these things, right, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. <coughs> Let me ask you a question. Was he lying? No. 
He was trying to tell these men the what? The truth. But guess what? When they heard those things, they cut them, they cut them deep because that's what the word does. It's a, it's a, it's a sharper than any two-edged sword, right? So they cried with a loud voice and guess what they did to their ears? Stopped up their ears. See, that's the only way that the word of God, let's think about this. When a man, when you read the word, right? And you put a veil over your eyes, can that light enter in? Faith cometh by what? But if you got if your eye, if your ears are stopped up, you're not going to have faith, are you? Because the the words can't enter into your ears. That's what truth does. Truth gives you faith, but it has to enter in. The light has to enter in through your eyes. You have to hear it through your ears. And these men, when they heard truth, they stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witness laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. <clears throat> and they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, look what, look what Stephen says. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice. He's going to say something that just the world can't understand. Lord, they're stoning me, but I want you not to lay this sin to their account, to their charge. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a sim another similar event. How is it that Stephen had that type of heart, that they're taking his life from this world, but he's asking God to forgive them? Well, look at Christ on the cross. He says, and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left, then said, Jesus, Father, forgive them. Why? For they know not what they do. They've got, their ears are stopped up, right? Their eyes have veils upon them. They don't understand what they're doing. They didn't know what they were doing when they were Stone and Stephen, they didn't know what they were doing when they were crucifying the Lord. They, because their hearts, right, aren't in the right place. They need the veil taken off. We have to show mercy to these people because the veil has been taken off of our eyes, our ears. Hopefully, we're not hating our brothers. Hopefully, we're not loving the things of this world. Hopefully, we get, we're full of light. And if we are, we need to understand that these people are in the condition that we used to be in ourselves. They need our mercy. They need us to be patient with them. He says, this because this is the problem. This is the condemnation. That light has come into this world, this evil world. And you know what their problem is? Men love darkness. Because their deeds are evil. They love darkness. They don't want the beam taken out of their eye. They don't want the veil taken off. They don't want their ears unplugged. He says, everyone that doeth evil, they, they, don't, they hate the light. They don't want to come to the light. So Christ is truth. Christ is the light. And if you're full of light, Christ said, if they hated me, who I, I'm the truth and I'm the light, they hate the light. If they hated me, guess what they're going to do? If you're full of light, hate you. they're going to hate you. Does that mean you don't tell them the truth? No, that's the only hope they have. The only hope for you to change is the entrance of thy words. That book has so much power that if you take off the veil and you unplug your ears, it will change you and it'll make you like him. And that's why he says right here, seeing then, that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil on his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is Molish. But their minds are blinded until this day, and it, the same veil until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament. He says, which veil is taken, is done away with in Christ. Now look what he says. 
But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the best word, so. Yeah, the veil's there, the beam's in the eye, the light can't get in, it can't change you. I mean, it can't, if you don't unplug, unplug your ears and take the veil out of, off your eyes and the, the beam or the, the moat out of your eyes, you can't change. And if you don't change, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom. You want your inheritance, right? You want to be like the Lord. He says, that veil is upon their heart to this day. Nevertheless, when it, Israel, shall do what? Turn to the Lord. Guess what he'll do? He'll take the veil away. Now the light can enter in. And if the the light enters in, something's going to happen. The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But we all, not with a veil, not with beams in our eyes, but with what? An open face, beholding as in a glass. Remember, the father is looking into the mirror and he sees his image, which is the son, which is the word. The son is the word, right? So if you look into the glass and see the word with an open face, no veil, you're going to see in that mirror the glory of God. That And what's glory? Light. Just like Moses. There is glory in that book. If you look into it without a veil, you know what's going to happen to you? You are going to be changed into the same image of that thing that's in the mirror. But you can't do that with a veil on your face, with a beam in your eye, and with your ears clogged up. God commanded that the light that's in that book to shine out of darkness. And you're dark inside. And if you will take the veil off and the light, the entrance of thy words give a flight, right? Mm -hmm. If you'll let that light come in, he says that that light that shines out, it will shine out of darkness. He says he shined it in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So you're now full of light. You don't have any beams in your eyes. You don't have no veil. You don't have your ears aren't plugged up, right? And now you, which were darkness, are now light. And when man light a candle, because you're now lit, they don't put it under a bushel. And they don't put it on a candlestick, right? I mean, they, they, they do, but they don't put it under a bushel or put it under a bed. They put it on a candlestick. For what purpose? It will give light unto who? Oh, God is trying to fill you with light. So then when you go out into the world, guess what? He can use that light to shine that light and help other people to make them full of light. And that's what he says. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Therefore, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Take the veil off. Take the, if you're hating your brother, go before the Lord. Lord, search my heart. Do I have any anger, bitterness against any of my brothers? Against anybody, right? Do I have any preconceived truths or doctrines that I'm holding on to and I'm not allowing God to correct me? Take the beam out. Let the light shine in and then God will save you. He'll change you right here. He will change you into the same image as the thing that's in the mirror, which is Christ. All right. All right. Anybody? Questions?